five, four, three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to Life in the Foam, the podcast about living outside of the mainstream media bubble. We're talking living in, as Google would say, your own anti-environment, a place to stand back and watch the chaos while not being necessarily in it. Having some perspective. Uh, I'm really happy to have Richard Altman on today's program. Uh, I met Richard at the Media Ecology Association as their convention uh, last month. Two months ago. It was absolutely, um, we had a wonderful time. How are we doing out there? Great. I guess it would be about a month and uh, a week ago, like June 28th. And you're back there in uh, Winnipeg now. In Winnipeg. Nice uh, day. It's probably going to rain within the next couple hours. Mm. It's been doing a lot of that here too in Ottawa. Um, So let's get right into business. Richard is a video arranger, as he puts it, um, who has been working on um, videos featuring footage of McLuhan. Listen, you must have seen more videos of Marsha McLuhan than anyone alive, but based on your uh, documentary he's been pumping out there on YouTube so far. I probably, you know, the people that maybe spent time with him would understand his body language as well as I do currently, or at least his speech mannerisms. I don't know who, there's a few people that do good imitations. Uh, None of them come to mind. A lot of them are, I think Tom Wolf did a good one where he's like explaining the origin or the first time he heard that phrase that um, moral indignation is a standard strategy for endowing the idiot with dignity. That one. He does it in McLuhan's voice saying something like, oh, and then he does the the phrase. But yeah, like you you really get to see and hear in a detached way, as you put it with the anti-environment, how it must have been to just like, had you ever become um, reflective, let's say in a social situation, I would imagine in the 70s, if you got along with Marshall and it was like your like hundredth time seeing him, socially but primarily you know in a let's say in a professional capacity you don't notice much unless you do but socially if you get along with the person after working with them day in day out in a, let's say the milieu of academia or the university at the time or any university and your friends you begin to see the grammar of of themselves of them just like how you know i can't imagine the grammar of me right now other than you know we become more self-aware as a result of our social media or at least more, um, we really empathize with performers. I'm on a stage right now, like actually, just because in case it does rain, I won't get soaked. I'll, ha- I'll buy like at least a couple minutes. But um, I've seen a lot of McLuhan footage to answer your question. For sure. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, you spend that much time pouring over someone, you absorb them mimetically. M- Mimesisetically? I don't know what the hell the word is. I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've got two installments of a documentary series you're calling um, McLuhan Unclaimed. So, so far we have Toronto Jungle, came out last month. And a few days ago you put out uh, the second one, Western Cynical. And we're talking like hours worth of meticulously edited footage, a collage, montage. Like the most, uh, you know, in the purest sense, montage of images and voice clips and... and uh, snippets of books and they're absolutely fabulous um i mean it's, it's it's something that you want to just turn on and leave in the background and look over from time to time and just let it soak in passively like if you're out there playing video games or something you want something to keep you busy that's not some lame uh, you know youtube stream western cynical is like three hours long or something uh, for, forgive me you, yeah you tell me. I, I mean it's two hours and 39 minutes but yeah i mean i, I once read i think on reddit because everyone, you know, I'll get McLuhan alerts in Gmail and um, it'll send you to these threads on various uh, sites. And um, and someone once said uh, that it was really great on road trips to just sort of play the stuff that my web cow tube has essentially ported from Bob's site, mm-hmm. which was essentially from the Library of Congress, a huge dump. That's where that all came from, Library of Congress and then Bob mm-hmm. at, from Ion and Bob blogspot and then some user named my web cow tube about two years ago three years ago put up all the put them all up and just added like the necessary uh stills to 
that video. Now, I, I do recall there is a lot of editing as well. And that's, it's all the same. Like, it's like, it's editing's the, what word processing was in the 80s, um, coming from the typewriter to word processing, video editing now is because I would say, and you'd know this maybe better than me, in my mind, 2011 was, let's say, uh, the beginning of mobile video being like easy, like on Android. And uh, ever since then, it's been no different than um, just uh, a grocery list. Like it's as easy as just writing a note on Notepad, and you know, for uh, reminders. You know, video editing. And um, and yeah, to, like to bring it back. I mean, the first movie was, um, and that's the art of information overload is pattern recognition so to know when to stop talking based on getting to truth you'll always get a distraction or some kind of obfuscation i am a win a pigeon was the first movie and we can get into that if you want about how that came about i initially thought the whole project would be 25 minutes here we are basically five years later three movies in and the next project is going to be called barrington McLuhan claimed and my word i hope it's short like 40 minutes would be wonderful. And it's going to be about, you know, Barrington Nevitt. I mean, there's, there's information for those that are interested in Barrington Nevitt online, but the work of actually sifting through it is essentially what I'm doing. And yeah. I could go on about this <laughs> if uh, you wanted. No, that's, it's really funny that you say a 25 minute project falls five years later into, um, I mean, that's kind of, <laughs> Three features. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, was it just um, sort of uh, this uh, explosive? Well, it, it, yeah, because it began, technically it began May 2014. It was just this sort of like um, desire to utilize this thing at the time was called MTS Stories from Home, which I think every province might have uh, at this point. Maybe it's just Manitoba, but... Local content was incentivized by MTS, which got purchased by Bell, but it still exists. And the local content incentivization was as a result that if you don't produce the local content, that it would be exclusive to the service provider. You um, would just have to donate that money to or like contribute it, not donate, but like you'd have to overtly contribute that 2% of your operating budget to the Canada Media Fund, which is fine, too. We all love Murdoch Mysteries, but whenever you see it, CMF with like this, like, you know, 8-bit sort of logo at the end, that's that money at work, which is also fine, but it's, Winnipeg's a very creative place, so it's interesting to have it done here. There's been like, I would imagine not, not exaggerating, 100 minimum of these stories from home, probably more, and they're all great. Like, I mean, some are stand out, but they're all, none of them are a waste of time. And so this was this began as something like that in May 2014, where it was like, how about doing one on McLuhan? How and more so, why hasn't there been one done on McLuhan? Which is a complicated answer due to Edmonton, educated in Manitoba, Cambridge, etc. But um, as far as every biography, and so it was this sort of concerted um, effort to place the importance of Winnipeg's influence on the shaping of Marshall McLuhan's personality, which between the ages of four to 23 is a formative time in anyone's life. And it, that was the reality of it all. So, um, so it began as that. And so the process to get that started, like, well, how do you find overt concrete proof of Winnipeg being an influence? That's not, and, and the emphasis was not in print because print is too, um, the medium of print is too vulnerable for concrete expression due to, let's say, in addition to it being just the translation of the acoustic into the visual, uh, according to McLuhan, on the characteristics of print by way of emanating from speech, etc. But to hear the person speak, it would be a lot more persuasive. It would, I w it's almost like method acting. Not that I act, but it's like it's 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 just empirical. It's it's what it is. So there was an interview in 1970 on CBC that 
apparently is not. Maybe this video slowly but surely will <clears throat> get this um, remedied. But there's a misclassified audio interview in the CBC archives, which I empathize with that misclassification because previous to, let's say, 70 or up to 70, CBC wasn't always national. It was national by way of every province operating their own sort of franchise version of CBC. Oh. And then it became national completely. But there was like an audio interview done in Manitoba or done by the phone, and done in Manitoba called um, Speaking Freely. No, no, it was called, uh, honestly, it was called Making It because it still had that pre-internet sentiment that you had to leave in order to make it, which is fine. It's understandable, but clearly not the case any longer. And so this movie, or this uh, radio interview, was with uh, Tom Easterbrook and Marshall McLuhan, conducted by a man named Danny Finkelman, also from Winnipeg, but more so known as a Toronto CBC DJ, who would play 45 records, 7-inch things. Called, I think it's called Finkelman's Records. And then, of course, naturally, without even trying to make this anything, Gary, ba no, um, Randy Bachman... Um, has the same kind of program now, also from Winnipeg. So whatever, that's just the middle of the country, the middle of North America, emanate doing what it does um, with the Winnipegians, those that leave, um, which is great. I, I just try. I always try to like not have. I have no sentimental attachment to any strategy regarding the civic uh, pride anybody should feel. It's not really a matter of uh, strategy. You are born, anyways. Um, 1970, making it, Easterbrook, McLuhan, talking about Winnipeg on the hundredth, on the centenary of Manitoba. This gets transcribed into a book imaginatively titled Speaking of Winnipeg, where the subject is, you're never going to believe this. Anyways, McLuhan mentions, it's a great interview. If you need, we can add a scan to Scribd in the description of this interview if anyone would like to read the McLuhan interview. Great idea. And, um, and and I'm sure through inter-university loaning and or just libraries across the country, it's more available than Gary Ginosko's uh, critical evaluations. Um, anyways, got that too. Anyways, um, it gets transcribed in 74, and I found a little bit of the same stuff audio-wise after like sort of giving up on ever finding the audio. Nina Sutton, by way of Archives Canada, has a very comprehensive two-week interview. That's yeah. like 19 files, 45 minutes of tape, and or a reel, whatever it was. It's a lot. It's like easily 30 hours of, of interview. Yeah, it's not so like interview, interview. It's conversational. Indeed. So I found some comment on, on, on that line from the CBC thing in there, and that's what began... At least I knew he had – now we were talking about life in Winnipeg growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. One line he says, and then I'll stop talking for a moment. He says uh, – she asks him, she presses him twice, and he doesn't have an answer because it's Marshall McLuhan. And he says – because he doesn't want to pin himself down. She says, do you remember any of these things that you used to say as you say you said them? And he's like, look, uh, the things that I said when I was 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 years old at the dinner table with my father are as – wild as the things or they're just like the things I'm saying now he would say would you say this in front of a group of men and he'd say that he said yes why not it's true so I would use this kind of stuff in the movie and as you mentioned before after I was familiar with the material for so many years yeah as a person that grew up here he's another person that grew up here and you can tell in the sort of like um, unqualified snobbery that gets surprisingly qualified unexpectedly. That's your typical Winnipegger. Which, Chicago Land Magazine, July 1969, he's, is the origin of the term Winnipegian. He does say Winnipegger in brackets after using the term. So he is aware. He's not like, you know, just playing around. He always reveals his um, point of view. He just doesn't like do it in um, like a baby. Great. A lot to work with there. So yeah, the, this this idea of uh, Winnipeg as a 
as this sort of um, central, uh, uh, you know, um, looking around, looking left, looking right, looking down, looking north. Um. <laughs> Spherical. Sphere of uncertainty. The sphere of uncertainty. That's that's excellent. Um, I mean, I well, we could talk about culture from from Winnipeg. Um, a large factor. That's not. Um, <laughs> um, no. Um, digging through archive material of Marshall McLuhan, you hit upon a few points that I've been. Um, um, well, let's contextualize this a bit. Nina Sutton sure. was a reporter, um, a, a famous Anglo Anglo French reporter. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure who was she with the Globe and Mail or something. Oh, gee, I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, she was from Paris, Paris and, and and London, and um, she had a book called um, Watergate Book, oh. literally titled not the but just simply Watergate Book. I believe it was about Traitor's Gate in England, which was originally known as the Watergate. But that's obviously a lie or a joke because it's, it was about the Nixon administration. <laughs> but McLuhan said in the movies, like, I can't believe that you've never heard this mentioned in the press that Watergate is based on Traitor's Gate in England and that there'd be a hotel in Washington called that. And he goes, the unchecked irony of this has never been mentioned in the press. And I'm pretty sure it's still never been mentioned in the press, but um, Adam Curtis's hyper-normalization does have a shot of Farage in a boat uh, sailing by with some people standing up in a suit uh, back to the camera in front of Trader's Gate, which is still there. So that's an aside. But yeah, archive material, um, Sutton's background, uh, Watergate book, and this book that she was going to do never got published. And it says in the movie, and she told me in, on the phone, which is also in the movie, that her, she felt like she kind of let McLuhan down. But her publisher felt that he wasn't uh, noteworthy by 1976 to warrant a, like, Truffaut Hitchcock uh, interview style book. Like a conversational, like interview magazine originally. Right, Or right. maybe still. Oh, it's a shame. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, huge. Oh well, I mean, God. it's good for me. It, well, it was sure. great. It, she got, was happy that she got use out of it, but it would have been how great would that have been to just have an as close to just a, a book long conversation between a, a, a very clever, intelligent woman and a very uh, clever, intelligent man talking about uh, whatever media, like sure. deconstructing media mid seventies. Right now, the closest thing I've got is okay. So I don't know I I'm waiting a long time to uh, figure when this was going to um when my uh, podcast was going to overlap with um, what we were mentioning before uh, Bob, because um, uh, I've read all of his transcriptions of the Nina Sutton interview. Well, not transcriptions, even just notes, some yeah. summarizing time codes, right? Um, so, yeah, the thing is, McLuhan as a media figure was uh, huge in the 60s, 70s, and there's so much footage, and there's so much archive material, and the guy wrote prodigiously. The, the guy practically exhaled um, sheets of paper and and scribbled up so many books that that he's probably one of um, the most self-consciously mediated people of the 20th century he knew that oh, he was leaving sure. behind himself in all the stuff that he put out and that someone else would pick it up down the line someone like you or me right like it's exactly what we're doing it's swimming through what this guy left behind in physical traces in various forms uh you know that he described as media while he was doing it right so um so you you mentioned my web cow tube. So yeah, um, back in 2017, I guess when when I got heavy into McLuhan, that was my first um, source for like dozens and dozens of hours of Marshall McLuhan footage because I was making my video series Silicon and Caribdis, and I was digging through all of his stuff and trying to get inside the headspace of this dude so I could look at the computer better. And uh, as you said, um, so this is just a YouTube channel out of the blue that's got tons of great raw. Mc clue and stuff it came from some eccentric gentleman named bob with whom i'm now familiar um friends with i suppose in a way but you know as much as one can be with a interesting Agreed. radio host uh long time underground uh, i was gonna say shock jock but he's, he's not shocking through no. through being vulgar he's shocking through being a conspiracy theorist a radio host guy who happens to be an absolute McLuhan nut with yeah. all of this stuff, I don't know, he spent dec decades gathering all of this footage and going out there and putting it online on his own little um, side, uh, you know, like, he's got a cult following. Um, well, he's, yeah, he's got a, he's got a, uh, what they're calling, like, you know, a side job. Um, uh, and, and yeah, like, just, I think, just 
the origin of his interest in McLuhan is like you know murky at at, at most clear. Mm. Uh, the clearest description of his uh, origin with McLuhan would be murky, not in a negative way, but just um just so far along that it's like you know just like any other fuzzy memory. And now, um, fuzzy no, but um. Yeah, like so, you 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 got exposed to it through my web cow tube, because he added the necessary, or he or she added the necessary audio or video or stills, and also there's Transition Twenty One, who would occasionally have things like Alan Watts and McLuhan stuff, and mm. add music to it from wherever. But yeah. there, yeah, there, like there's a lot online, and and this just became a real good um, meal of reference material to be able to pour over. Occasionally, if you're lucky, YouTube would generate an automated um, transcript, so it would be easier to search within the timeline, Definitely. which let me just say before we get too far, the timeline is the future because it is the only aspect that needs to be leveraged to the extent where it will basically bring us, um, it will be the development of our time, will be the leveraging of the timeline in a video player. But that's an aside, and it's not as nearly as um, pat uh, to understand just like that. And I'm not going to explain it, but leveraging the timeline is the direction our civilization is going in, the complete. Like, you know, as McLuhan say, the whole world's now dumped in the Western lap by way of electricity. Okay, well, this is how you, like, you know, move as a group. Yeah, that's where I'm going with this. I mean, so you've got this abundance of material that takes someone dedicated with hours and hours and months and months to spend pouring through it. And, and, and I mean, information hunting. In Electric Age, a man becomes hunter, but instead of hunting food, he returns to hunting information, right? So you got to find what's salient. Yeah, data processors. The young person today is a data processor mentioned on the Massage LP. Yeah, data. Right. And so the act of trying to uh, create, well you will end up becoming a mythologizer. What you're trying to do is, is you know, data compression. Through, exactly. Through myths, through, through cliches and archetypes. We're right, trying to uh, compress, find the, the salient points, remix it all. Um, I mean, that's what I started to do, and then I, I'm so happy to have found a culture like this where, where there's more people trying to, uh, you know, specifically use McLuhan to... Um, make sense of what the hell just happened the past hundred years. Because honestly, people who have been living through the past hundred years, who are watching it unfold in real time on their television, according to whatever, you know, one of the few official news outlets was saying, are, it, it boggles my mind to think how much everyone's going to have to relearn from scratch what the hell happened to them compared to what they remember having happened when it happened. If I can put it yes, I mean, that points to um, the figure ground, I believe Ruben, by way of whoever came up with uh, Zeitgeist con concept of the Zeitgeist, the whole um, is it a is it a goblet or is it two people facing each other in silhouette? That whole mishmash of studying the content rather than the form, yes. delivering rather than the form delivering the content. And, and, and I believe McLuhan and Sutton get onto it because that's the other thing with McLuhan. He's basically saying the same thing every time throughout all the decades. You can nitpick his tools got sharper. He got better tools to say the same thing, but he was saying the same thing. Now, what that was, I believe you could just summarize with a unique sensory mode of perception about the forms of communication. I don't think I'll be able to repeat that, but unique sensory mode is due to the stamps. The rest is me compressing uh, whatever I just said there about communication mediums. And he says to Sutton, he's like, you know, a lot of people have studied the, the content, but no one's bothered to study the form. He's like, I don't care about the skullduggery behind who owns the Washington Post. I want to study the form of the press mm. or the form of ARPA, DARPA, Internet. You know, like, it's impossible to visualize the non-visual, which is the electronic and or acoustic space environment, acoustic space coming from A.E. Bot by way of Jacqueline Turwitt by way of Carl Williams, who we grew up with and went to Calvin with. I'm not saying they were friends, but they certainly were. I believe Carl was in room 35 and a half and Marshall was in room 36. So at Calvin Technical High School, which Neil Young went to as well uh, for tourists. If they had a walking tour, which they may once they steal it from me now, and it's also in the movie, good. I don't care about the money. 
it's the same thing that gets you to complete a movie. If you start something, you have to finish it. And then you just have to trust uh, that you made the right decision to begin. Mm-hmm. And as far as McLuhan, we're, I'm in the park right now, Cinnaboyne Park. And Howard, um, Howard, not uh, Gossage, <laughs> but Howard, who was at the, uh, the, the, the uh, MEA conference, who put on McLuhan Faith and Works. And that's where I first met Andrew and, and Eric back in 2015. Uh, November, no, October. I forget Howard's last name, but he and I, he was always trying to get uh, a bust of McLuhan in this real estate hall of fame in the park here, which is great. It's good just because random people who don't know who McLuhan is now have two places to not know who McLuhan is. (laughs) Marshall McLuhan Hall at U of M, where they'll walk by peripherally reading and never knowing that his mother's maiden name was Hall, of course. And here, where they'll get a, eventually a, a bust of McLuhan's um, head or face. But the problem is, like, what's it going to look like? It's just going to look like famous McLuhan, which nerds like me are going to be like, but, but it doesn't matter. Um, I think there'll be more things about McLuhan in Winnipeg in, in due time. But it's, it's a start, and things happen in threes, so that's good. But I'm sure that's – we've gone on – I've gone I've, – I've taken it off. So to try to get it back to the line of thought that we were talking about, the concept of just studying the form, seeing what happened as you put it in the last hundred years. There's, I don't think there's well, it, the model for the economy is not really fit, like geared towards like creating a, a, a world of philosophers who understand the, the resonant uh, ramifications of the forms that allow them to express what they think is on their mind. But I think if we can monetize it somehow by leveraging the timeline, we can at least have another uh, economy that's based more so on um, on the mind. Now, whether it turns it into the matrix where everyone's battery, um, again, as Bob would say, that's the chemical body. So there's other bodies, but who knows? I mean, we're dealing with like this as the as the record says, it's like. Um, baby, this thing is bigger than all of us. The mm. separation from being and meaning with words i mean yeah okay so it's it's a huge thing and i mean i'm there you're here this is an aspect of it utopia means nowhere so dystopia means probably somewhere but it's based on the fact that you'd never have the word dystopia without utopia which means nowhere so handle that eloquent um yeah here here are uh, you know you and i nerds like us uh, walking uh, you know taking first steps into this mythopoetic rewrite Boom. <laughs> yeah. The foam. Yeah, we're in the foam. Uh yeah, yeah. There's a you know, this this terrain which was first hacked down by um conspiracy theory radio hosts insofar as trying to rewrite the grand narratives as they were experienced by people living in situ who are now forty, fifty years old, thinking that they knew what was going on in the twentieth century. And so yeah, like you said, McLuhan is only going to become more popular from here on out. You are you you and I are both, you know, trying to hack away, give the first kernels around which, you know, um, culture could seed in a more self-aware way about the very forms which surround you and I, um, insofar as screens and microphones and televisions and how they're all wired up while everyone else is, you know, oh, I don't want to get too, um, too, uh, you know. Sim- right. Too, no, but uh, I, I hear, I hear exactly what you're saying. And it, it is just that it's forms. And once you realize that you realize that they have characteristics to the various if you're doing video editing and you have video, uh, the video is going to be reflecting of, I don't know, your point of view because that's what the video is of. And then you'll find there'll be resonances or coincidences or overlaps that are simply just the grammar of existing that was already there. But now you're seeing it in another medium, so you see it differently. And then when you go back, so like going back would be the uh, influence of the written word on the spoken word. When that process happens, you're aware of it. And that's all that's happening is that you're becoming more aware of processes that you have no control over, but can at least uh, be astute enough to recognize in order to find the patterns, which reveal more patterns. And as Dave Chappelle said, the more you know, the more you really realize you what you don't know. It's like an asymptote. You know, it never, it's never going to touch that vector. Of course, of course. Ever. You can only it may really... go backwards. It may go backwards, though. <laughs> you only reveal your own ignorance. The, the deeper yeah and and that's the only way to find someone's knowledge is to know their ignorance as McLuhan would quote Coleridge the great thing about McLuhan is what you were saying before about the prodigious amount of material and I hope it hasn't gotten windy 
But due to the fact that he had not one, not two, not even three, but five degrees in literature, makes you sort of think perhaps he was interested in literature. As a result of that, his mother's an elocutionist. His father is basically like a guy like me who's like, so how's it going? And then you talk about how's it going for 18 hours. And you're like, I got to go to sleep. And so there's the ambitious, his mom, and non-ambitious, his dad, gifted conversationalists. Elsie to the extent, that's his mother's name, was Elsie, Elsie Hall. Uh, I don't remember her middle name, but born in the Maritimes. There's a picture of her as a three-year-old in 1892. And she became an elocutionist that, according to Tom Easterbrook, the university, university friend of McLuhan's, Williams would have been a high school friend. There are a lot of, like, younger friends mentioned, but, you know, it's in the movie. I'm not trying to plug the movie, but it's in the movie. I only found it as a result of research. I was not looking for it. Um, she became an elocutionist that Easterbrook said could hold an audience for two or three hours. He'd ask her, don't you get tired? And she said, if you know how to use your voice, you wouldn't get tired. So he's coming from this world where not only are they excellent communicators verbally, due to the five degrees in literature, he's going to understand almost all narrative constructs from like, you know, cave drawings to the Saturday comics, and then find how each little narrative construct could pertain to, let's say, the news of the day, which is a good segue due to the fact that it rhymes to say, and I'm not even trying, I don't care. The reason it took so long is because it began in May 2014, and then it's now. People couldn't believe, let's say, the futility of the democratic process and that imagery and or reality television became a factor, which is like, oh, you're telling me this popular genre of television, which is supported by advertising, has influenced communication in the United States? Mm -hmm. Tell me more. <laughs> and so in the movie, it says uh, June 21, 2015, Facebook uh, post. With no reaction, not a like, not a reply. It just says Trump will win. It's not because I like Trump. It's just that anybody that goes off script is going to become more identifiable. And that was how he got the nomination. And the rest was uh, how it went. And Agreed. now it's just like, okay, well, which industry are you going to cater to? And I believe that's just called politics. So whatever. I mean, it wasn't new before. It's not new now. And it won't be new tomorrow. Someone's got to be mom and dad. In this case... It's the Republicans are dad and the Democrats are mom and they're having a fight. In, so that's that. I've just summarized everything. Aren't I a fucking brilliant genius? No. We still have to create a new economy by way of the timeline. Next question. No, just kidding. But I'm saying, but that's, <laughs> it's just so bloody time consuming to like have to. We are the articulation. Cope with other people, cope with other people coping. Yeah, sure. no, and stating the obvious in the most simple, sublime, putting it into words, going through the effort of laying out the obvious thing that everyone misses, it's it's a labor, but you, <laughs> catching people up, catching people up to what, you know, the past, let alone what the hell is going on in the present. L May 2015, I put out my video begging journalism, listen, you can't, you can't, like, just lie to people anymore, everyone can fact check your shit, journalism for the 21st century has to embrace the crowdsourcing ethos of everyone getting their shit fact checked be you got to figure out how to leverage it yeah leverage it for cash yeah if they do mm. it well it's like you know why do people go see uh musicians that they like well see here's they the, the problem with that is the internet you can't make money on the internet which was what was supposedly yes uh, what, what i remember it was proven with the first dot-com bubble burst in the year 2000 right I, that's right when i started becoming a hardcore heavy internet user and it was just like well it's impossible to make money on the internet because everything just gets co copied for free anyway and you know um uh website owners begged their their users to please shoot them a few bucks to keep the servers running and otherwise otherwise it was a barren wasteland of pirates like myself who could just binge all of the you know the cream that floated the top right uh i was out there torrenting oh all the best movies of the 20th century watching um uh you know network and uh the converse right the conversation and rosemary's right you just it's you can just like skim all of these you know like um w what did i miss before i was born in, in in watching the best of the best according to all the internet nerds who were sitting around right. right like that's what it was like to live in the foam to you know um be out of sync with whatever the hell was in the in the you know the box office it was, this week 
but it was a live action role play where everybody was having a conversation trying to remember the name of an actor. Yeah. And then now you can just go, what's the name of that actor on that show? Oh, it's this. And then not really have a follow up. It's like, well, what are you going to do with that free time that you've spent that you're cumulatively saving second nanosecond by nanosecond. You have like a whole life mm. that you don't know what you're going to do with it because there is not another um, method to leverage context itself as a commodity which will only happen with this leveraging the timeline which is basically just like if you see something that is like you know needs a citation like uh who makes this you're like i need that and someone goes oh for some reason a friend of a friend of a friend saw that clinton the geek interview with that other nerd and they were talking about that guy McLuhan, who a lot of people seem to mention on twitter every hour they're like did you know you're not gonna believe this the sex organs of the Information 3 gorilla. And he also said something about Osborne Village. No, I mean the global village. He grew up in Osborne Village. Huh, interesting. Yeah, they called it Fort Rouge. Naturally, they don't know where that is in CBC land because it's from Winnipeg. So you're dealing with this Baudelarian symbolist poem of reality. Mm. And all these people need is just to figure out how they can take the ability to just have this other industry and leverage that. And it's easy. I mean, it's kind of in torrents. It's kind of, I would imagine, torrents to me link up to uh, Bitcoin. And all Bitcoin was and is, is just taking your $1, going to the arcade, turning that dollar into five tokens, because that's the incentive. You get an extra token. And you get to play the video games. You get the extra token because it's such a mind F to get five tokens for a dollar and let's say you, you mentally can't even play more than four games at first so you end up going back and using the token in the one place that it's usable so it all comes out of like tokens from at least for me the arcade torrents and just like this like sort of micro employment that's going to happen by context itself being a commodity and the incentive to actually provide reputation well and then reputation capital where Oh, you've identified this a thousand times. Now the company that makes that is like, hey, if you ever see stuff that here's our list of products. If you're if you're indexing that a thousand times, you're probably going to like know what something else is that we do. And we'll give you 10 cents to do it. Now, no one's going to retire on this stuff, but it has the makings of a new economy that doesn't require physical infrastructure. It's completely different. The method of producing revenue where the only thing will be like, well, how do you split fractions of pennies? But at scale, with a network effect, we all know that fractions of pennies, like you take that David Chow guy who did the mural at Facebook there, and all of a sudden, um, you know, he was given like a percentage, and then it went public, and that little percentage, like fraction of a percent, is now like, you know, he probably doesn't have to work ever again. So it's like you never know what virality is, with social influencers is like, cleavage pets babies so what happens if you're just smart but on like you know and we're, we're obviously talking the truth here because it's beginning to thunder the thunderclaps in finnegan's wake are just the um symbol of a new technology and that chapter would be the effect of that technology on society at the time and each of the characters in finnegan's wake are a medium or like a technology itself it's not like a they, each one represents like radio tv newspaper etc i'm I don't know Finnegan's Wake as well as to explain which acronyms are what mediums, but that is what's happening. So yeah. that does maybe help a little bit what what what's going on there. And and just like yeah, generally like just you know yeah, you get to contextual you get to contextualize people's opinions and impressions online, and um, and now it's a problem because everyone's caught up, but eventually. Yeah, so one way or another, tagging context and just looking at video as a research, and that gets back to the movie, which gets back to the precedent of the telegraph, let's say, supplying the environment to the telephone 30 years before the telephone, because apparently someone was trying to fix a telegraph and it exhibited what we later realized were characteristics of the telephone. So my movie, in order to actually get the movie, watching it is good, but the style gets annoying. It, you don't need to watch it. If you have YouTube where you don't need the video, a road trip would be good. 
but it's really the ability to look at the entire thing as an inventory of references, and you can cont contextualize it however. I can jump in want. wherever you want. I mean, yeah, and, and the behavior, the which, which is Innis, which is McLuhan describing Innis or himself, and that's in the movie too, because I can't do any, I just needed to find stuff that justified the sloppiness of my natural style. And McLuhan happily provided that. He'd say, Sutton would say, are you serious? And you could say a person would walk into your book. I say, walk in, open your book at any page. He's like, any page, anywhere. And you can't read Innis because if you read Innis too much, you'll go mad. Because every sentence is a world. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying that every sen every edit's a world, but it's just like, just, yeah. Like, it's it's a reference, and you can pop in anywhere, and it'll probably relate to something you were just thinking of. Not because of me, but that's the, that's the characteristic of the form of video editing when you have such a rich media. Okay, that's a coincidence. Yeah. But when you're dealing with rich media video, it's going to happen because there's just so much information it can't not happen. Yeah, that's so... What so I'm going to try to like wrap, wrap up what we yeah, just I'm said, at, uh, because I mean, I don't know. I zero. have to include the, um, the, uh, listener somehow. Um, so yeah. I mean, a hundred years ago, the telegraph's been around, newspapers are getting more and more popular, media's exploding and, um, the mod forty telegraph comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by, uh, the early 1900s, everyone's mind is being blown and, uh, we're becoming, uh, you know, crazier, right? Um, because there's so much media you can, uh, you know, live, uh, uh, in your imagination, right? All time is coming together, the past and the present, and people are starting to relate the books that they read to what's going on in their life. And, and uh, borders are dissolving in the sense that, you know, you can follow news from around the world for the first time. And so we're, we're entering the modern age and, uh, James Joyce, the, the, um, Irish, um, author was writing uh his books which are getting weirder and weirder using language in a more and more poetic way to uh, uh cul culminating in finnegan's wake which is just an absolutely insane impossible to understand book where he just makes um here i'm just gonna read uh, page 394 um, here we go and after that so glad they had their night tentacles and there they used to be flapping and cycling and doing and doing loop panamentically around the waist of the ship in the wake of the good old phone again as tired as they were and the winds were Winds widths and the waves lengths and the clipper built and the five foremasters and the lolly of the cleft off by gourd arts of the row and the fair cheeks exchanging fleas from host to host. I'm not even going to finish this sentence because it's probably like three pages of, without a period. The point is, humanity's at like peak insanity. Joyce is wandering around throwing language together in the most oral way that he can in the most lineal typographical, you know, prose words on a page way trying to like put the mind back together again because everyone's going crazy and then we have two world wars just out of out, out of all of it so so now what what we're trying to talk about here is how McLuhan's like retracing what the hell just happened throughout his life in the mid to late 20th century he's putting together in his own way the fragments of what's going on and now we're have to carry on putting together what the hell has been going on in this infinite content explosion of meaning which which uh, is the maelstrom the media maelstrom the matrix just just the the american dream anything right the uh the the overwhelmingly bright light of uh of uh of consumerism which blinds people right i mean um and and keeps them tethered to uh needing to pay through the nose to absolutely accomplish any basic thing be because people are slaves to uh, paying experts to do all their stuff for them which is you know how the economy works but uh, dust is settling, and we're trying to extract the forms. Mm. I gotta ziplock this phone because it's uh, it's not starting or like I mean it's 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 uh you know just in case it's not man. raining hard. Oh okay, but yeah, right. let's okay so so okay so I'll finish, finish what you were saying like um how we're we're trying to make sense of what happened and um as McLuhan yes. said. Right, I forget who he quoted in saying that book came too late, and then he said, "Oh, no. oh that's uh, yeah, yeah, Le Lemartin, Jacques Lemartin, Jacques Lemart yeah. or seventy-one. Yeah. And when writing the Gutenberg Galaxy in the early '60s, he's like, uh, "Someone should have written this book a hundred years ago. I wish someone else to had save written. people time." Yeah. Like, and the, one of the things people he said that people said, like, "Oh, you sure you certainly expect your reader to read a lot," which is the typical sort of like, "Are you kidding me? Are you putting me on, or or what?" Like, I'm saving you the time of having to read the stuff. You simply have to do the unspeakable. Trust me that my excerpts are actually worth your time and maybe fine. Read one of the books from the 500 examples I provided in the Governor General Gutenberg Galaxy winning 1962 book that has Global Village. Also, G. Anyway, 
I just want to say, you have Finnegan's Wake with you right now? Yeah. Go to page 254. All right. I just and, uh, yeah, just, uh, let's say, like, two sentences from the top. It'll say, like, um, Orion of the Orgias. Mirshel McMuhan, the Ypsi dad, and product of the extremes giving Oshidians to our means. As might occur yes. to anyone, your Brutus lay a man with the princess champion in our archdeaconry, or so eclipsed from Cleo's clippings. With clippings. Right, so it's like clippings, Cleo, the muse of history, and... So the Cleos are like an award show for advertisers. And for so, advertising, yeah. And Cle so like, um, Ipstad and product the, of the extremes, given quotidians, given quotes, so he's able to reconcile opposites. Orion... I don't know, has something to do with space. He did happen to be born on July 21, 69. He did die when he was 69. The moon landing did happen in 69. His wife, he said, um, you can go to page 69 or 96 of any book to get a style of that book. Oh, his wife, Corinne, passed away at, you're never going to believe this, 96. And so, yeah, I mean, resonances, they're just what they are. Well, the human mind, but, um, yeah. the human mind makes meaning so easily. Yeah, but that's almost like, you know, complicated resonance throughout the infinite expanse of existence for dummies. Like, that's, like, super easy. That's, like, so, that's, like... That's, a, that, that's, that's like, where everyone gets lost and goes crazy, is as soon as you become overwhelmed with all these resonances, you, you immediately, you're certifiable. And well, coming out of you, that... Yeah, yeah, you have, to, you have to hope that you, like, can somehow, like, you know, dial it in, because, you know... You have to live it at this scale. That's the other part, and that's and that's really what I guess it's all about. Is that just calm down, like mm. keep you know absorb it and real realize that like you know none of it is better than the other. It's always been how it is, and it'll always be how it is. And you just have to be like you know evolved enough to be responsible for the astuteness. Because it's not going to change. Yeah. It's just going to become, you know, like there's a big existence out there. And there's going to be a lot of things that there we have in common with a lot of things. And that's it. Yeah. You know, you still have to pay. You're still going to have to pay bills. You're still going to have to go to the washroom. And you're still going to have like a joke uh, every once in a while. Um, you know, like waiter comes to a table of people that like, you know, were born in the 21st century and just says, is anything all right? And it's just kind of like, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. I mean, it's literally raining in the park, but it's okay because I, you know, took some consideration into it all, and you know, I'll be responsible if my phone doesn't work, you know, because I have two other ones that are as older, and it's just like, how hard is it to get a SIM card, you know? Like, but it's worth having the conversation with you because I mean, you don't have them that often. Sorry to monopolize it, but uh, you're the guest, you know. and. Well, You're, uh, but I mean, <laughs> go ahead. No, no. I think this is exactly what I've been trying to get at with this um, podcast because this is advice. You're uh, giving out chicken soup for for the lost soul, trying to gaze <laughs> what, at the world on this scale. Thanks. Which uh, which episode number is this? Do you oh, know? Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna fuck up. Excuse me. I'm gonna mess up the video by uh, by checking. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's, oh, it's okay. It's all part of the process. Yeah, yeah. I think it's episode uh, nine, double oh nine. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, like, I don't like. I mean, I really appreciate it. I I listened to uh, the one with Kim on a bike ride, and uh, I I I really enjoyed meeting Kim and her story is also interesting as as someone who was reporting the early internet or like around people that were reporting it as well, and just like how. You know, the managers that be were like, whatever, internet, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, you're saying to me that you think people are going to, like, do this? It's like in uh, McLuhan's Wake when George Thompson is talking to McLuhan, and he says, like, uh, so you're saying that people are going to read less? And McLuhan's like, yeah, literacy <laughs> is on the skits. And this Thompson guy's like, oh, he's a shocker. I, I can see why you got the reputation. Whoa, so it's just like, yeah. like, you know, like, yeah, it's that way, and... You're, you're all better at this than you realize. I think the overriding message of being an Occidental optimist rather than merely a Western cynic would be to say, like, as a human, we're quite capable of handling minutia. So get ready to flex that muscle. It's called 
thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much low... I, I think what we're doing right now is tackling the low-hanging fruit. Um, Probably. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, dummies, this is what, what you missed, even though it was screened in, into a mega... Like, I've got I've got your copy of Howard Rangel's The Virtual Community, right? And, yeah, you know, I'm familiar with him. He's using the jargon, um, you know, CMC. Oh, CMC is going to change everything, and that was, you know, the uh, computer-mediated communication, right? Or I mean, he's not him and, and Stallman and all those people. They're not wrong. No. Just like how... McLuhan's not wrong, but people will say, like, oh, he didn't have the vocabulary. He just left it in an electronic environments. Like, that's enough. Yeah. You, you know which direction to look at when he says that. Yeah. That's the point. People get, hung up. Like, people get yeah. hung up on the terms, the superficiality. Right? They figure try to figure, figure, figure color... rather than ground. Figure, figure yeah. rather than ground. That's, why, that, that's how social media has been perpetrated as this new thing that just, like, a, came on the world all of a sudden 10 years ago. It's like, no, no, like, forget that. We've been doing this for decades. You just haven't been well, reading like, the literature yeah. back when it was called CMC, back when it was called, you know, the Information Superhighway. We've, we've been doing this again and again and again, replaying the same movie um, for for decades with, with a new... Oh, it's starting to come down on you. Yeah. Here, wait, hold on. I'm just going to, like, quickly... Uh... Okay. I mean, people, people like, cook... And then they can go to a restaurant. Social media is like you were going to a re- you're going to a restaurant. You have you saved up some money. You went to a nice restaurant or you were invited somewhere for dinner, and it was great. For let's say you know you went to a restaurant, great restaurant. Every, how you went to a great restaurant every day? A where, how, you probably can't afford it, and then B even a great restaurant every day is going to get boring. So it's now boring for everybody. Everybody now understands in this social media assembly line what it's like to be let's say i don't know not what they are but what they'd like to look like and act like they're doing and even that acting it's like it's a job Mm -hmm. you know like like that's the thing that people don't think about it's like they watch the stuff they get entertained by it they think well hey they make money i just watched on some show uh that this person has a yacht that's like you know the size of like you know several planets and so it's just like um okay well it's a job. Eventually, it's a job. So if you can cope with that boredom, then maybe it's for you. But don't go into it thinking that it's not going to be boring and it's not going to be work. And that's the etherealization of hardware from software, as mentioned in uh, Take Today and, and many other things, is like now everybody has the institutional power to express themselves. And it's like with great power comes great responsibility or with great power reflects on you that hey you're not as good you know once you hop out of the cliches and you actually have to create content that's like contributing to the gestalt it's not easy and you can't always just be cute and pretty and funny or rely on the latest slang term to call to action the group who's just getting older every second so it's like yeah the low-hanging fruit (laughs) but it's just you know again context as a commodity could at least alleviate some of the financial friction not a lot of it but some of it people could know that hey oh geez maybe i'm intelligent as well on this level that i never thought i was intelligent and actually made some money not much but some i've got several ideas now that's all we want basically giving people the empowerment so they don't have to bother someone else mm-hmm and it's you know, it's self empowered empowerment. It's a great, it's a crazy concept. Actually doing your work so that you can like have some time to yourself to do whatever you want, and then you're gonna probably have to do the work again, but you'll get time again. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. Uh, and there's chocolate. Handle it, you know. <laughs> Fuck. Sorry. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, it's true. I mean, in this frictionless, well, the frictionless media world. Now, etherealization is is the term you, ju- you just used. The whole disembodied. Here's you and I speaking. Like, actually, this this conversation has been extremely natural. Um, the technology, yep. right? This is fantastic. Um, totally possible to do this without a lot of money, and it's using stuff that everybody has, including an alphabet, in which to uh, you know uh, shape what they're thinking with words. 
that they're speaking, <laughs> not necessarily always just like, you know, writing it. Five Fingers Tax the Breath, that poem from Explorations is hilarious. It's like writing, taxing, breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a... Uh... Yeah, so what 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 sort of homework are we giving the audience here tonight to follow up on? Um try to do some try to just uh create some kind of art that you um feel helps you uh get beyond uh the nagging sort of feeling that you might have, like that you feel this urge to express yourself, find something to express yourself. That that you do for free. <laughs> yeah. Find art that you do for free, and that's what you gotta do. Once you put it out there, once once you've created it, you can start to get some distance from it. It'll start to tell yeah. you things you didn't know you were trying to tell yourself. Very. That's the first thing you'll notice, and then you'll realize, oh, well, so that that's on an on that's an ongoing development that seems to be inherent in pretty much anything that you consciously uh, focus on. Mm -hmm. To, to the extent that you focus on it, you'll notice uh, patterns, resonances, uh, remind yourself of things. But yeah, art, art as survival is is not a flippant statement. But I think if I were to add a gloss of practicality, it'd be art that you do anyway, including your relationship with your significant other, including your job, including all your obligations. Still find a moment. If let's say you're writing, if you do write. And let's say you get writer's block, you can't do anything. Even if all you do is spend like, you can only afford 10 minutes. And all you get is like a word. That's good enough. As long as you don't, you know, just persist. Just persist on something that you do for free that doesn't affect anybody else except your own uh, impulse to express something. And try to make it useful. Don't try to be... Um, unnecessarily provocative because that's easy do something that it's a challenge but that you'll do mm -hmm. you know like that you'll finish you're not trying to impress and anyone it's it's not rhetoric um agreed. it's survival it's straight survival survival on that note uh thank you richard Alt. um standing out there in winnipeg in a wonderful park with the ring coming down as the thunder claps uh we're out of time but join us again next time <laughs> see that <laughs> look at that okay. Okay, you know, thank you, Clinton. Uh, it, it, that, this was a lot of fun, and I'm uh, honored to be on the... Um... Life. In well, no, it, what, is it called, like, Memories of the Foam? Hmm. Living in the Foam? Life in the Foam. Life in the Foam, on yeah. The, on the Concerned honored. Netizen um, channel, ConcernedNetizen.com. Uh, I'm going to throw links to your stuff down below. Everyone needs to watch. Have. Yeah. Download it. God knows what's going to happen yeah. to YouTube in the next year. Go make archived copies of uh, McLuhan Unclaimed, Toronto Jungle, <laughs> Western Cynical, and just have them playing like like psychic driving in the background of of, uh, of your environment. You're you're going to learn a few things regardless. Thanks again, man. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. <laughs>